All right. Um, thank all of you um, for, for coming. Um, obviously, this is a topic that attracts a lot of attention um, in itself, plus the fact that we have a, a really outstanding panel to discuss it. Um, I'm Kevin Finner, and I'm the editor of Issues in Science and Technology, the policy uh, magazine of the National Academies, and the director of the Committee on Science Engineering and Public Policy. And, um, and I'm going to be the referee for this debate. Um, and a lot of this, um, this is obviously a, a perennial issue. The Academy has um, dealt with this in any number of reports. And um, I can't even say that we agree with ourselves all the time on whether or not there's a shortage or a surplus of scientists and engineers. I actually have someone working for me and we're thinking about doing a memo on this. And many of the um, reports conclude without saying whether or not they think there are too few or too many. They might say there are too um, few of certain groups, ethnic groups, too few women, and so on. But and then we have reports like Rising Above the Gathering Storm, which was produced by my committee that you know, clearly said that we do need more um, STEM graduates for the good of the economy and the good of the country. So um, as we get um, started in this, I was just, just going to plant a couple of questions um, for you to sort of keep in mind as we're listening to all of the speakers. Um, I'm not an expert on this, and the extent of my ignorance um, knows no bounds. So when I go into this debate, I keep wondering when people say, well, how many STEM graduates do we need? How many STEM workers do we need? There are questions about, well, for some people that means PhDs. For some people it means bachelor's degrees. For some people it also includes people with technical degrees from community colleges or people, maybe they're, you know, a minor in math or they're, you know, there are a whole variety of ways of looking at it. So I think one of the things we have to think about is what, how we're framing the, the types of people that we're looking for. Also, we're look, thinking about whether or not we're looking at needs now, um, the needs that we expect, or the needs that we're aspiring to. Certainly in Rising of the Gathering Storm, they were saying, well, we do need more um, STEM graduates, but if we're going to do that, we also need to be investing more in R&D, and both in the private sector and in the public sector, so that we employ these people. So, But when we get that money, we need to have the people who can use it wisely. And uh, so we have to look at that. And, and also, we're looking at um, how we define um, job needs, exactly, and when certain types of skills are desirable, when they're essential. And we're also looking at whose responsibility it is to do the, to produce the people with these skills. So, I mean, some, for instance, some people will argue that um, we don't have the right graduates, we don't have the people with the right skills for the jobs we have, and then people retort, well, um, we're not trade schools here, we're universities, we're producing people who you can train to do these jobs, this is the job of the private sector to provide those very specialized skills that they might want to have in their workforce. So we have to decide where you set the dividing line on when people need to have these skills or the ability to acquire these skills in a reasonable amount of time. And of course all of this then intersects with a very contentious and much more diverse debate about immigration, the nature of the advisability of H-1B visas versus green cards and permanent um, citizenship. And, um, and that opens up another um, additional can of worms that I don't think we're going to get to get to in the initial discussion. I think we're going to just try and focus a little bit on exactly what our um, needs are, the skills are, um, projections are for what we are going to have and what we might need. So there are many questions and many ways to, um, to look at this, and we're really fortunate to have um, the panel that we have to look at this, and in fact, even knowing many of you in the audience, um, we could fill the panel two or three times with people who also have expertise here. So I'm hoping that once we have the initial discussion among the panelists, we'll have a good opportunity for discussion um, with everybody in the room. So um, with that, let me very quickly um, introduce her. Did, was there a handout with all of the bios on it at the door? Um, I don't know, but I'm not going to do full introductions um, of everybody because I want to get to the subject matter. Um, uh, first speaker is going to be Jonathan Rothwell, an associate fellow with the Metropolitan Policy Program at Brookings, and he's an expert on workforce needs and labor and STEM workforce and everything else we're going to talk about briefly. Um, other speakers, he'll be followed by um, 
uh, Ron Hira, who I know from participating in writing for issues and longtime participant in these discussions. He's associate professor and chair of the Department of Public Policy at the Rochester uh, Institute of Technology. Um, following him will be Rob Atkinson, uh, president of the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, also a regular contributor to issues in science and technology, getting ready to publish a book review of his in the spring edition, just going to the printer tomorrow. And uh, um, Rob is obviously an expert in this area and in a number of others, in particular the role of technology in the, the economy and, um, I don't know, hard to know where to stop um, the boundaries of, of what he's familiar with. And um, finally, we have um, Hal Salzman, and Hal's at um, Rutgers. He's a sociology professor at the Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy and the Heldrick Center for Workforce Development at Rutgers. Um, Hal has done a, a number of studies on the uh, adequacy uh, supply of workers for, the, for STEM jobs, and um, I think this debate was really set up by an article, a recent study that he did and an article that we published in Issues that we can use as a really kind of starting point for the discussion that we're going to have today. So, um, with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to um, Jonathan, who will do the first presentation, and we're doing this, at least starting out in Oxford style, with eight-minute opening statements from all our four panels. Okay. Uh, can, can everyone hear me? There is a shortage of STEM workers. The problem was briefly ameliorated by the Great Recession, but four years of economic growth have exacerbated it again. As I see it, there are three reasonable approaches to defining shortage, two of which were established by Nobel Prize winning economists, and the third is what I consider a layman's definition of shortage. They are as follows. Uh, shortage is indicated by an increase in the relative wages for a set of occupations or skills. Uh, the second definition is uh, that job vacancies are going unfilled for that group of occupations. And the third is that workers who attain or obtain those skills are doing better. So let's go through each of these. Are relative wages for STEM workers growing? The most comprehensive way I can think of to answer this question is to examine Census Bureau data going back to 1950 and combine that with ONET data, which rates every occupation in the economy by the level of STEM knowledge required. From this, one can disaggregate STEM knowledge and see how the value has increased or decreased over the last 60 years. Uh, the trend is, is uh, unambiguously, since at least 1980, in, in favor of higher returns to STEM knowledge. So uh, in 2012, there's a 30% increase in the earnings of of workers for one standard deviation knowledge, uh, increase in the knowledge, uh, STEM knowledge. And that's holding constant education age and experience. Now, if you find that a bit abstract, let's look at two specific occupations for the last, uh, or since 2000, computer workers and engineers with bachelor's degrees. Both, uh, for both of these groups, relative wages have unambiguously increased from now what about mo recent graduates with STEM degrees? How have they fared? Well, it turns out using uh, data from the Census Bureau, which goes back to 2009, the group of, of students that have seen the largest increase in wages are majors uh, in computer science and engineering. Okay, but what about the claim that my, uh, my, my colleague here, Hal Salzman, has made that uh, wages have been stagnant for computer workers since 1990. Well, in my, in my view, that claim is based on a failure to consider how education requirements for occupations have changed over the last few decades, for computer workers in particular. So researchers at the University of Minnesota's IPUMS program classify all modern computer occupations into one of two categories, both of which are roughly equal in size. For the first category, wages have increased dramatically every decade uh, and have, are now at 82,000 in 2013. For the second category, wages increased every decade for the most recent decade. Now, uh, that does not indicate necessarily a fall in demand, 
as, as my opponents may argue, it uh, is related to the fact that the educational requirements for those jobs have fallen. And this is due to the diffusion and proliferation of information technology and something that should be celebrated in that it signifies a wider swath of career paths to STEM occupations. So yes, relative wages are growing. Are STEM vacancies more likely to go unfilled? They are indeed. Uh, this is data from the conference board. It collects data from every advertised vacancy online. And this sample is the 100 largest metropolitan areas, which we, we purchased this data from the conference board recently. And what it shows is that the percentage of job vacancies that go unfilled after one month is significantly higher for healthcare workers, for computer, engineer, and, and science workers than for any other group of occupations. And not only is it harder to fill these jobs, the trend uh, is indicative because the fall in the difficulty of filling these jobs during the recession was less severe for these occupations than for, say, construction workers. And the recovery in this labor market has also bounced back much more rapidly. So that as in, in early 2012, it was as difficult to fill jobs in STEM occupations as it was in 2006. Now, if you look at the most recent data from the conference board, this is every advertised online vacancy in the United States, what you see is there are five job openings for every unemployed computer worker. In fact, there are more job vacancies than there are unemployed workers for all of the core STEM occupations. On the other hand, if you're a construction worker, you're competing against 10 other unemployed construction workers for a single vacancy. And as it happens, the absolute number of job vacancies that go unfilled for 60 days or more, this is using job opening data from a company called Burning Glass, is, is the highest for computer occupations. This uses data for the first quarter of 2013. So STEM vacancies are, in fact, more likely to go unfilled. Now, does STEM knowledge make workers better off? Let's consider this by looking at unemployment rates for poor STEM occupations. They're extremely low. Of extremely low compared to what they have been if you could, if you average over the last 13 years. And they're low even compared to the record low unemployment rate nationally, which is 3.6 percent since 1970. So 3.5 uh, percent is the highest of this group of engineers, scientists, computer workers, and it's as low as 3 percent for the science. <coughs> Now, what about salaries of, of recent graduates? Uh, that, too, indicates that these workers are doing very well. The, uh, the, the majors that have the, the highest earnings are biology and chemistry, followed by computer science majors, and then engineering majors, physical science majors. So you can see that the STEM majors are earning very high salaries. So what then to make of the claim made by Hal Salzman and, and his co-authors that there are twice as many computer science majors as there are Job available, jobs available for computer science workers. Well, their evidence for that is uh, uh, draws on an incorrect inference, in my opinion. They, they argue that since 50% of computer science majors do not go into Census Bureau classification computer occupations, then that somehow means that they're not using their skills. Well, it turns out that 90% of computer science graduates are working in occupations that require above average computer knowledge. And if you look at the most common occupations that they go into outside of computer occupations, they include managers of other computer workers and top executives. I very much doubt that the CEOs of Google, Qualcomm, and other tech companies regret their decision to major in computer science or feel that their computer science degree contributed little to their career. So yes, STEM knowledge does benefit workers. And in my view, according to all three definitions, uh, there is, in fact, a STEM choice. Thank you. Okay. All right, here. Thank you, Kevin, <clears throat> and thank you to the audience. Um, so I agreed to this debate with the hope that it uh, spurs sustained, sober, and systematic data collection, analysis, and I think most importantly, uh, the development of good analytic frameworks of, for thinking about STEM labor markets, uh, how they're behaving, whether they're healthy or not. Uh, and getting away from arguments about shortages or, or, or not shortages, and I'll get into that in a little bit more detail. But let me just point out one of the data points here just to illustrate anatomy. Um, so I was getting back to this analytic framework. So I think uh, just one of the data points that, uh, that Jonathan just pre presented presents an opportunity to talk about that. So, for example, I follow electrical and electronics engineering unemployment. And employment rates very carefully. I, I 
Uh, I'm a member of IEEE, and I'm active with the IEEE USA, which tracks this on behalf of their U.S. membership. Uh, and this is DLS data, labor statistics. Uh, in 2013, the unemployment rate for electric electronics, uh, electrical and electronics engineers was 4.8%. Uh, by Jonathan's definition, this is, we should be jumping for joy, this is great, and so on and so forth. But in reality, if you trace uh, the time series for unemployment rates for those types of occupations, at full employment, we would expect about a 1.5% unemployment rate. So we're about three times the level where we should be. By lumping and comparing it to apples to oranges by the way Jonathan is doing, by comparing it to the general population, you know, with high school dropouts and so on and so forth, who naturally have higher unemployment rates based on their the sectors they work on. You're, you're doing a compa comparison between apples and oranges. And I think this is also illustrates part of the problem that we have in the public discussion about this. I've been in, in uh, two congressional hearings where Brad Smith, who's the chief counsel for Microsoft, has tried to use the same kind of argumentation about unemployment rates in a very false way, I think, and in purposely misleading ways. And I'll, I'll be very frank about it. Um, and we have to put the political context around this, right? This is big money uh, being spent pushing these kinds of things. And I think we need a, a much more serious look at these analytic frameworks. You could make these arguments about what the unemployment rate should be. My judgment is that it should be about 1.5% for electrical electronics engineers. Um, and, and I could go through lots of other occupations. And if you're curious, I actually have all of this written up uh, in commentary that's over on the desk. So let me get back to this. And I think this is an opportunity. Uh, is this debate, I hope it's not a one-off opportunity. I hope this spurs of greater interest in trying to do serious work here. Um, that we, that this isn't a, a matter of someone winning because they have rhetorical skills or clever argumentation, <coughs> but that we're actually uh, making progress in our knowledge about how these STEM labor markets operate because it's so important. It's, even though it's about 5% of the overall uh, workforce, uh, it has a really, the STEM labor markets have an outsized impact on economic competitiveness, national security, uh, economic growth, and so on and so forth. So I hope you don't come away from this um, from this uh, debate um, confused, but I think I might, might suspect you will because you'll see lots of data. In 90 minutes, you can't really get through those data because we don't have and we haven't agreed on those types of analytic frameworks. Um, there's a big disconnect between what you'll hear, at least in the public rhetoric, of, about STEM shortages, even coming from places like rising above the gathering storm, with what happens actually out in the real world when you talk to actual engineers, um, or chemists, or biologists, or postdocs. And most of you who are around the room know that, right, in your day-to-day -day lives, talking to these folks. I think it really uh, was crystallized when, um, when President Obama was on an online town hall meeting talking about the need for more engineers, and he was asked by uh, a woman, Jennifer Waddell, who asked, you know, why is my engineering husband been out of work for so long? And so President Obama responded by saying, well, is he in civil engineering? You know, with the construction downturn, uh, it could be that there's been a lag there. Uh, and she said, no, it's in semiconductor engineering. And so President Obama was actually visibly flummoxed by this response and said, how could that be? Uh, all of my CEOs that are on my jobs council are telling me that there's a severe shortage of these types of workers, so uh, we'll help you find a job, and we'll help your uh, husband find a job. Of course, they didn't follow through with that, but that's what it matters. Um, and Darren Woodell is employed now, but no help from that. So let me also make a couple of quick observations uh, based on uh, the fact that I'm, I'm an engineer. Uh, I think I'm the only STEM uh, person here. Um, well, it depends on the definition, that's right. So let me make a couple of personal observations, uh, having lived the, the labor market in electrical engineering, but also observed it for, for many years. First, there are multiple labor, STEM labor markets, and it's silly for us to talk about a STEM workforce shortage. There isn't one STEM workforce shortage. Some of these labor markets, like mechanical engineering of the last decade, have done pretty well. Uh, some of the labor markets, like electronics engineering, has done actually quite poorly over the last 10 years, in large part because the industry has offshored a lot of work. Intel just announced a layoff of 5,000 workers, even though they're very profitable. Um, and so, the, and, and Intel, of course, has been at the forefront in Washington pushing the STEM workforce shortage. So I think we need to be really careful about talking about multiple labor markets based on the, uh, the disciplines, the fields, 
and also what level you are, your bachelor's, master's, PhD. Even within electrical and electronics engineering, <coughs> power engineering is doing really well right now because there's a demographic shift. So we need to build a thicker and richer description of each of these different labor markets and understand them. And doing these sort of broad brush uh, things about how there's a, a broad based widespread systemic shortage of workers doesn't make much sense. Chemists, for example, if you go to the ACS data, uh, they earn in real uh, wages 74000 in 2013 versus 80000 back in 2003. And this is just me surfing on the internet, pulling this stuff up, not doing it in a systematic way. Let me also say that um, we should be very clear about political motivations and political interests. Um, and I think we forget this in, in Washington and in Washington discussions. Uh, employers want to keep wages down. This is how they make more profits. I mean, let's be just very clear about that. There's nothing evil or wrong about that, but they have motivations here. Uh, and, and if you have any doubts about that, if you follow what's happened very recently in Silicon Valley with the lawsuit, and a settlement with the Justice Department of anti-competitive behavior where uh, Steve Jobs, uh, the late Steve Jobs, warned the POM CEO of, uh, of not poaching his employees to try to keep wages down. You know, just read those emails. I mean, that should make it very plain and simple what's going on there. So we should look at the motivations, and just like there's motivations by workers to try to limit competition. Uh, and so they'll have their representatives trying to push that kind of thing. And I think the one big under-examined area is the role that universities have played in uh, these debates and discussions. They're not a disinterested party. They have a set of interests, and they've been promoting things. And I think most people, most lay people, don't really fully understand the university motives, and that would be a great research project uh, to, to talk through or to, to undertake. So I think we should have this open public discussion that there are multiple stakeholders with conflicting interests on these things, uh, and the role of policy institutions is to shed some light on, on what the actual uh, uh, labor markets look like. Um, let me also say that I think, um, and, and I've got about eight more things, but I won't get to them because I know I'm running out of time. Well, you've run out of time. <laughs> well, I got stuff. I've, I've got mine. Uh, last, last one. Right. Okay. That is that um, I think in all of the discussions we've been overly focused on degree production. The most important STEM workers are incumbent STEM workers. The, the largest share of STEM uh, workers who will be in STEM in the next 10 years, in 10 years from now, are current STEM workers. And almost all of our focus is on degrees, students, the pipeline, as opposed to what's going on with incumbent STEM workers, what kind of workforce development they need, what kind of labor market they're facing in terms of flexibility and more. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, and uh, I want to thank Kevin for hosting this, and uh, Hal and Ron for agreeing to do this debate. Uh, for those of you who want to get the slides from Jonathan or the video, it'll be on our website and maybe posted on other people's uh, up here website. Um, so I, I agree 100% with Ron that this is a really complicated question, and that sound bites don't get us too far. And hopefully, we can make a little progress here today, but. Fundamentally, it really is incumbent upon everybody who wants to know this to read the various things. Uh, Ron and Hal's work, Jonathan's work, our work, uh, particularly a work we a report we wrote with Marilyn Mayo called "Refueling the U.S. Innovation Economy." So I want to do two things quickly. One is respond to what I think Hal is going to say, at least what he said in his last issues article. Since I'm before him, I want to respond to that. And then, secondly, lastly, talk about framing how this debate is framed. The argument that Hal and other people have used to make this argument that there's no shortage relies on a number of true facts, but misleading or not very relevant facts. For example, Hal argues that we don't really have a problem because we're the, we have access, U.S. employers have access to the largest body of STEM workers. Uh, they do, they also have the largest demand for STEM workers. So yeah, we have more STEM workers than Sweden, but it's a sort of meaningless uh, statistic. Uh, Hal has also used the statistic that we shouldn't worry because our math scores uh, are improving, showing that we're actually going in the right direction. This is true that math scores have gone up 2.7% over 36 years on the NEEP. Uh, I don't think that's really relevant to the debate. Uh, Hal and others will use the point that 
uh, the pool of STEM majors actually increases between freshman year and graduation, thus the leaky pipeline is untrue. That's uh, true, but misleading again, because really what you need to measure are, there are a lot of people who go into college who have an undeclared major, and then they move over. If you just look at the people who come in with a declared major, and then what they leave with, the actual uh, leaky pipeline is quite leaky. Uh, Seymour and Hewitt found that 44% of STEM uh, freshmen switch out, uh, compared to 30% of humanities majors. And there's a lot of reasons for that. And I bet if we got into a policy discussion, we could all agree on a lot of what we, some of the fixes are. Higher, uh, lower average grades in STEM courses, harder work, uh, poorer quality of lectures, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but also, as Tony Carnavali has pointed out uh, from uh, Center, Georgetown Center for Work and Education, uh, that Tony's pointed out that there's actually, uh, using the ONET data, there's a particular sort of orientation through work interests that STEM workers have. And the idea that we can somehow, that you're as equally likely to get a kid who's a natural musician or um, a painter to go into STEM because wages go up 6% is really misleading. There's a certain STEM workers and as other workers have particular characteristics. Uh, in terms of just overall supply and graduation rates, what we see are actually not encouraging from 2000 to 2007. Non-STEM bachelors grew 24% in the U.S. Uh, compared to 16% for STEM. Masters uh, went up uh, 2% a year, uh, 93 to 2007. For STEM, total uh, went up 4%. Um, one of the key arguments that Al and others make is that there are, we produce 50% more graduates than are actually hired. Uh, there's two problems with that. They're using opening data, job opening data, which is not, which is not net, uh, which is not gross, excuse me. It's just looking at sort of new jobs opening. It doesn't account for the people who leave uh, because of retirement or taking care of a family member. When you do that, you end up with a basic estimate of we're producing the same amount of grads for the same amount of, of, of job needs. So there isn't this oversupply, and on top of that, you know, you can call diversion into other occupations a problem. I don't see it as a problem because there are many, many occupations besides formal STEM occupations that require and value STEM knowledge. Uh, unemployment, Ron said, well, you, you know, there are certain ones that are higher, certain ones uh, that that shows a problem. But again, when you look at overall unemployment for all STEM workers uh, with a college degree, you find that it's 2.5% uh, today. Uh, that's above its 20-year average of 2.45%. So essentially it's the same. Uh, computer science uh, is actually lower than its long-term unemployment rate of 2.8%. So let me just close by... Uh, um, actually, one, one, one last point here. Um, <coughs> uh, Hal has said in his work that, the, uh, that IT employment is below its 2002 to 2003 peak. Uh, when you actually look at the BLS data of IT, IT workers, IT occupations, uh, what you find is that it's actually one of the fastest growing occupational category uh, in terms of number of jobs. Total workers employed in IT occupations in the U.S. grew 19% from 2003 to 2010. Uh, total U.S. workers grew just 0.8%. So they're essentially growing at a much, much rapid pace than overall uh, employment. BLS projects that STEM workers will grow about twice as fast, 19% to 10% over the next uh, few years. So how do we make, how do we make sense of this? Uh, I think we make sense of this, and you know, Ron alluded to maybe that big money is dictating this, and I hope you're not implying that that is dictating uh, the kinds of policy work that the Academy or Brookings or ITIF would do. I think there's a different kind of explanation here. It's not about uh, money or interest, uh, at least I think among the scholarly community. It's about sort of ideology or doctrine, if you will. How do you think about how an economy works and what are the goals of an economy? Do you think an economy, the major goals are equity and fairness and opportunity, or do you think the major goals are innovation and growth? While we support and encourage uh, opportunity, I think for our orientation, the major goal is to get more innovation, more productivity growth. The problem, I think, with the framework that, that Hal is bringing to the debate and Ron is first of all, it rejects what's known as Say's Law. Uh, in their mind, there's a fixed supply, fixed demand. That if you add to that demand of STEM workers, <clears throat> you're just now demand and supply, the price has to go down. In fact, uh, Say's Law is an economics term, but it basically says that supply can create its own demand. And we see this. We see that more STEM graduates, many of them, actually go out and create companies. 
Olin College, for example, in Massachusetts, the young graduates of that engineering room go out and create companies. Those companies employ more STEM workers. So supply, uh, demand is not fixed. Secondly, I think that our, that framework fails to understand the nature of global labor markets for STEM. Even though wages have gone up, I don't even think that's the relevant measure anymore. Wages carry a relative compared to, say, doctors. We don't, we're not competing with India or, or, or Russia or Germany for doctors. So what doctors' wages can go way, way up, and the only problem is we end up paying more in Medicare. STEM worker wages have some natural cap, because when they get too high, companies have lots and lots of options to go around the world. So I don't think that that necessarily, I don't think that sort of looking at wages, even though they've gone up, is the right measure. Finally, uh, one could argue that actually uh, higher STEM wages themselves are not progressive. They're not in the uh, interest of fairness and equity. Uh, STEM workers are among the highest paid workers in this country, and if STEM worker wages don't go up as fast as other wages, that by definition means that lower income workers are going to be paying less for products produced by higher income STEM workers. So I think the sort of focus on let's just get STEM jobs to be paid even more, even more, if we really believe that, and I'll close, um, if we really believe that that's the goal, then why don't we propose shutting down Rutgers and uh, Ren and, and Rochester and, and a few other major colleges in the country because they're producing way too much. They're creating this glut and they're hurting these poor workers. If we could just get rid of the MITs of the world, cut back supply 20%, these workers would have a better life and we'd all be better off. That to me shows the illogic of the debate. If we don't want less because of that, then we do want more. Thank you. Um, well, I, I, just on the last, oh, just on, on the last, on the last. Well, no, you know, I, I was just called you know, by uh, education commissioners from one of the states trying to decide whether they should uh, approve expansion of some engineering programs in their state. And whether we're creating over so that is actually a conversation that's happening. Uh, I'll, I'll leave that alone. I'll leave that alone. Records. Let me let me start with the bigger question: Is there a is there a STEM shortage? Right, that's right. By which we mean is hiring demand greater than available supply? Just kind of simple thing. And the answer is, of course there is. Right, of course there is STEM shortage. And is there one right now? Well, yes, there absolutely is one. And I think it's instructive to look at that one, the one that's happening right now, and uh, one that happened a while ago. So in the past few years, the demand for petroleum engineers has picked up dramatically. Colleges weren't graduating enough to fill entry-level jobs available. <coughs> and the result, and here we can take you back to Econ 101, wages shot up, the number of graduates almost tripled in two years. We also have a case from the IT industry, which is late 90s up to the dot-com bubble. Again, you know, Econ 101. Wages went up, the number of uh, computer science grads went up, just tracked up, uh, just kind of a classic, you know, supply-demand model, graduates followed. And then the bust happened, number of graduates fell off, and wages fell. So average wages fell to their kind of pre-dot-com bubble, which is about where they sit today. So average wages today are the same as when the, uh, you know, creator of the internet was vice president. And that says a lot about supply and demand. So yes, we have examples when there are shortages. And remarkably, supply, demand, the market models seem to follow. So we want to focus on IT a little bit, because that's about half of the STEM workforce. And as Ron pointed out, we heard actually Rob and Jonathan's comments, it depends on where you look in STEM, dynamics are different. This is not one workforce, it's not one set of workers. So, Let's focus on where the policy action is, which is around IT. And the question you need to explain is, as the industry has recovered, the hiring has increased, but not wages. So why haven't average wages increased if there's all of this high demand that we've heard about? How can you explain it? In short, the explanation is that there's a new source of labor that's been created, which is namely guest work. And this pool of workers was created in part by the growth of offshore uh, IT firms who train workers, and by U.S. colleges that have tailored IT programs, particularly at the master's level, to provide entry into the U.S. labor market. So what we've done, and then 
aiding all this was legislation that provided U.S. firms access to this labor, H-1B, L, O-P-T uh, programs. So it's this combination of offshoring being discovered and developed by both U.S. firms and offshore firms who <coughs> have moved offshore to grow their operations. And when you manage an offshore project, you need about a third of your workforce on site at the client, uh, client site to manage requirements analysis. And guest workers are your best and cheapest source of labor to do that. So in short, what happened over the past decade has been a shift from a domestic labor pool to using a guest labor guest worker labor pool. So the demand is not because of a shortage, but because of a preference. Right? For lower cost labor, labor tied to offshore sites. It's an understandable preference, but make no mistake about it, it's a preference, not a shortage nonetheless. It doesn't mean all H-1B workers, for example, are hired for these reasons, but it's the predominant use. And one that has been significant enough, because it makes up such a large portion of the STEM workforce, to fundamentally alter the landscape for STEM workers in different areas, different dynamics. But the result has been essentially discouraging U.S. students from pursuing those careers that they have better options. When we talk to students, it's clear, and we see it in the data. Well, how much has the landscape changed? The current, right, you know we've had a, a kind of long-standing depressed economy, high unemployment, and yet IT firms are hiring, it appears to be, guest workers for about two-thirds of all entry-level positions. So to repeat, two-thirds of entry-level positions are being filled by guest workers. How do you explain that? It can't be just that there's no domestic supply. And from the policy end, what is the IT industry asking for now in the new immigration bill? They want the ability to hire guest workers for 150% of all expected new positions. Yeah, 150%. At least that's the number that the industry has provided. So Brad Smith from Microsoft, in front of Congress, said there are going to be 122,000 net new openings. And the Senate bill, by our estimate, provides 180,000 guest workers for access to them. And I've been looking, maybe our colleagues here can tell us, what's the rationale for that? I mean, I think we're all agreed, you know, it's the number of guest workers immigration has got to be above zero and somewhere probably below 250 million. So the number makes a lot of difference. How do you get at those numbers? In closing, just a few other sort of fast facts that address some of the various arguments in the debate. Are there enough STEM graduates overall? Well, we graduate twice the many that are hired into the field each and every year. Even in professional fields such as engineering and computer science, about 50% more. I missed some of Jonathan's earlier parts, maybe he'll clarify, but we did look at those who go into a science and engineering field versus outside of that field, and it's still 50% uh, graduation rate higher. Not enough students in the pipeline. We've heard about you know, the dismal STEM performance. Well, in fact, if you look at course completion at the high school level, biology, Physics, calculus, for goodness sakes, uh, you know, statistics, chemistry, all of the, you know, quote, hardcore uh, STEM subjects, completion rates are up 50% over the next, over the last two decades. Students are taking more and more science, completing, and going up. Uh, you know, performance, is it going, uh, what's happening to actual performance, not just completion, steady increase, it's rising, and amazingly a rising across all groups, all demographic groups, black, white, male, female. There is improvement. If you look at the highest performing school districts around the world, Massachusetts comes out at the top, about another half dozen states not far behind. You know, Massachusetts, Minnesota, places like that are right there at the top of high performing school districts. Uh, Rob, Rob mentioned the number. I mean, that's, that's exactly our point. Is if you look at you know, all the hoopla about who the high-performing districts are. The list is Latvia, Finland, uh, you know, Sweden, very small countries. So that is exactly our point. That firms are looking to hire where their large labor forces are. Large numbers, those large numbers of high-performing students are in the U.S. To the claim, finally, that U.S. students lose interest in STEM subjects 
And here, I, I gotta ask you all to participate. But just take a moment, think back when you were 17. Right? What did you want to do when you were 17? Just a show of hands. How many people here are doing today what they thought they would be doing in the job when they were 17? A few. All right. Yeah. You thought you'd be a lot uh, ahead. I wanted to run a big thing. You did. Okay. Well, we have to run see. I mean, how much do we really want to make on the minds and thoughts of 17 year olds? Not a whole lot. Actually. What happens in college is 17 year olds come in with all sorts of interest and thoughts. And college is the process of sorting that out, your strengths, your weaknesses. So yes, there's a lot of movement. Our point in the study that Rob's referring to is there's a lot of movement and it flows both ways. Um, and this is good. People should find their interests. There should be better matching uh, in both things and a lot of cross-pollination. And we are addressing some of that issue. But a lot of kids come in and they do flow in as much as they flow out. So anyway, just to, to wrap up then, uh, you know, the market does seem to work on, uh, in the labor market, that, and it really is supply and demand, and that when supply goes up at lower cost, brings wages down, it does discourage workers. Some of the other work we've done show that it does seem to have effect in, in quote, best and brightest, leading for other fields, and fortunately, probably it tends to be finance. <laughs> And uh, the performance is good. That we are performing could, of course, be better. There are large problems at the bottom, but we just don't see the evidence to certainly not to justify this idea of uh, providing the industry the ability to hire every single opening from offshore. With that I will. Resist. Okay. I think I'm going to start by just giving everybody. Um, the, the four panelists just sort of two minutes to respond to anything specific that you heard in the, the presentations that you might want to ask about or, or question. So we, we can start at the beginning with Jonathan. Okay. Yeah, I think I want to start with uh, Hal's point that, that we're arguing that two thirds of entry level STEM jobs or computer I, IT IT jobs are being filled by HBs. I'm not sure where that that number comes from. But um, well, we, we, well, we've we, read the report. I think we have the documentation. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take another look. But the fact is that if you look at conference board data on the number of job openings for computer workers, it's 600,000 per month throughout 2013, give or take a few 10,000. So I'm just trying to do the math here. We allow just over, just under 200,000 H1B workers total into the country every year. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and that includes the university professors as well as the companies that, that sponsor workers. So how, how could it be that out of a pool of 200, less than 200,000 workers, they're able to fill what amounts to about 4.3 million job vacancies in computer occupations every year at a rate that's two thirds? Okay, sure. Um, you're, uh, you're kind of mixing and matching different numbers. Uh, what, you look at is not the vacancies, but the number of people who have taken a new job within the last year. So that's the number of hires. Okay, so we said it's the number of hires. Yeah, there's another discussion about these vacancy numbers, which are not there. So if you look at the number of people in IT who were hired in a given year, the number of uh, guest worker visas that are issued that go to I that go to IT, that's two thirds the number that are hired in a given year. Does that make sense? Yeah, except for that would mean that out of the 4.3 million job vacancies, that only a tiny fraction actually resulted in hiring. And that just doesn't seem well, This is IT. There aren't that many people in IT. I, I know. There, in fact, there are more job vacancies what? than there are IT workers. We're, we're, I guess we're talking about IT. Yeah, computer occupation specifically. Right. I could, we go to the conference board website. We could say, we can, I can show you the press release. It's about 600,000 job vacancies every month. It's, uh, I, think, I think it's a more technical discussion that we're going to fill out here because vacancies right. are different. It's churn. We're talking about new hires and the actual hires, not advertisements and kind of these vacancy measures. But if you take the number of hires uh, and the number of people on guest worker visas, it's 
two thirds the number of buyers. Well, I, I guess they're. You need to, well, we, okay. I think this is okay. okay. I think this is, this is a good yeah. offline discussion, but I, this yeah. is really just to raise some of the questions and try and highlight some of the okay. things that might deserve more work and, sure. and more definition. Mm -hmm. Ron, okay. you guys, do you have, sure. Uh, so I think a, a couple comments. You've heard a lot of data here. Uh, this is a perfect illustration of what I'm talking about. There is no standard analytic framework for looking at vacancies and trying to convert that into employment. Um, and so we're really talking past each other. Uh, there were a couple of clever things that were said. For example, the average unemployment rates for computer occupations uh, have been 2.8%. Of course, that's including times when we've had severe recessions with computer occupations. And so if you take the average, it's actually going to raise it above where we would expect to be in full employment because of cyclic uh, variation in unemployment rates. If you take the average across both recessions and full employment, you're going to misleadingly have a biased uh, level of unemployment high. Uh, similarly, there was a, a statement about uh, the number of STEM uh, degrees, and conveniently it went up to 2007, which was kind of the bottom. Uh, of course, since 2007, uh, folks have gotten labor market signals and engineering enrollment and degrees are way up uh, significantly. We're graduating about 72,000 bachelor's degrees in engineering. Uh, back in 1999, it was about 59,000. Some of that's demographic. Some of that is relative labor signals. There's also a lot of clever techniques. Um, I would even call them tricks, talking about uh, STEM employment growth and wages relative to the rest of the population. Of course, we're in the worst labor market. We've had the worst labor market in the last decade since the Great uh, uh, Depression. And so you're comparing, really, um, STEM labor markets, which I would say have been relatively lousy in the last decade relative to what they've done in the previous seven decades, uh, versus a really, really lousy general labor market. So this is perfect illustrations of what I'm trying to talk about, which is people picking and choosing little bits and pieces without us having, I think, uh, progress towards agreeing on the right kinds of analytic framework to use, how do we use vacancies, how do we look at unemployment rates, and so on and so forth. Uh, so a couple of things. Just one, one point, though. I, I really didn't use uh, the word clever tricks with uh, Ron or Hal's work, because I don't think that's the right way to frame it, and I really don't appreciate it, Ron, when you imply that our analysis is clever tricks. A couple things on Petroleum engineers, uh, petroleum engineers are not really the right way to think about this because, number one, what they're doing by raising wages is they're getting people who, were, who would have gone into a different engineering field to switch over. They're not adding to the STEM pool. They're switching. Secondly, given our petroleum market, which is now booming, the demand is so great that they don't have to worry about pricing out of the market, petroleum engineers. They're not going to go to Kuwait to drill for oil now. They can drill for oil and gas here. So it's a different labor market. Uh, the second thing, Ron, uh, Hal mentioned IT wages. Well, BLS data, 2003-2010, and I'm sure, Ron, you'll think we're doing a trick by only going to 2010, but uh, that was the last time I looked at the data. So uh, computer support specialist, overall wage growth, by the way, from this period was 1.7%. Computer support specialist, 7.1% wage growth. Software developers, 5.2% wage growth. Network and computer systems administrators, uh, 4%, and computer scientists, 2.8%. Uh, so you see a large share of the IT workforce saw uh, real wage growth. Absolutely, there's this, there are some IT occupations, particularly programmers, which is, by the way, the lowest occupation, lowest wage to paid occupation in CS. It's the occupation that's been offshored the most, as you would expect. So those are the kinds of jobs the Indians can do very well, or low other lower wage countries, uh, lower skilled countries. So the overall IT, IT wages have grown uh, quite significantly. This point about discouraging U.S. students, there is really zero evidence that U.S. students, when they're in college, think, oh, geez, am I going to be able to make, you know, $2.4 million over my lifetime or only $2.34? Oh, it's $2.34. I'm not going to go into STEM. They just don't do that. And again, I read that Tony Carnavale uh, study I encourage you to read. He says, um, an economist does not decide to become a doctor because it pays better any more than a nurse decides to become a mechanic or a historian seamlessly translates into a chemistry lab. These wage issues just are not, you know, it would be one thing if, wa if STEM wages were below the average. Okay, I get that, but they're already among the highest paid jobs in the country. Those are not deterring the, the, uh, the supply issues. 
And the last point about foreign wage, foreign, you know, where all these companies are importing foreigners to keep wages down, and the level is so huge, okay, this is the assertion. If that's true, why does Carnivale find, we find no evidence that immigrant STEM workers are paid less than native STEM workers, and in seven of eight education groupings, immigrants earn slightly more. On, similarly, Gordon Hansen and Matt Slaughter, UC San Diego and uh, Dartmouth said, quote, there is no systemic evidence that wage differences between U.S. born STEM and immigrant workers. We have found no consistent statistical difference. So that's very, very inconsistent with this argument that a massive swarm of low wage and STEM immigrants coming into pressing wages. The evidence is very, very clear that immigrants are paying the same, if not more. Uh, so, well, I agree that that's not 820, but it's part of that. Mm -hmm. uh, just, I'll just, just to the last point, then, other audience, uh, you know, and, and this is a, actually a key point for this discussion in general, which is the guest worker issue gets kind of uh, confused with the immigration issue. And it's very, very different. Broad based immigration policy is, we would argue, part of the nation's success economically, socially, and historically. And this does not speak to immigration policy writ large, but specifically about these temporary guest worker programs, which is a very, very different dynamic. This is coming in and largely targeted one industry, few occupations, <coughs> around wages, around offshoring. It's not about enriching, bringing in a broader workforce that comes in very differently. And Ron's work can talk about you know the, can, the transition from H one B to uh, worker being very low, but most companies don't even support that. So the studies you're talking about are is immigration good? Absolutely. Do, do we show that there's a benefit from bringing in you know, certain groups of, of immigrants who contribute to the labor force? Absolutely. We're talking about guest workers, and the studies that look specifically at this guest worker pool, which is very very different show that, in fact, they're paid less um, than uh, the domestic labor pool, which is the domestic labor pool, both native and immigrant, both citizen, permanent resident. And the question is, for an employer, are you hiring from what's available domestically, which includes all these groups, or going to an H-1B temporary visa labor uh, program? And it's partly wages, it's partly working conditions, it's partly tied to offshore, but there is a preference to go to, uh, you know, in the IT industry for this very different uh, workforce, and those studies don't speak to it. So the very few studies that do speak to it, should, where you actually look at just the guest workers, show that uh, guest worker wages are in fact a little bit lower. Just to be clear, you have to acknowledge how there's a variety of studies that there are. I can point to two right now that show that guest worker wages are higher. There are studies. So you don't please, like please, please Mythius and Lucas and Lofgren and Hayes. Now, can I finish my statement? There are also studies out there that point to your point. So the, there, I don't think there is any consensus in the scholarly literature on this point. There are, I, I believe there is. I mean, the, the one study, Lofgren study, which actually doesn't show that, he shows the uh, <coughs> less and then... I, uh, we, we need to give Mary a lot of Five percent wage premium and lost. Well, the, that's not enough. It's his analysis. Well, uh, <laughs> we're actually looking at the data, and he's revised some of the numbers, but he does also actually, even in the published paper, show it's lower. So, um, you know, this will we'll, we'll, play out over the next few weeks. There also is, by the way, a, a survey from the National Science Foundation called the uh, a, a National Survey of College Graduates, they ask people if they are current H-1B workers. And those that answer yes report higher wages than Americans with bachelor's degree. And then when you, when you control for occupation and experience, it's at least as high, if not higher. So according to a variety of, of databases, H-1B workers, on average, are paid the prevailing wage. I, I just have to see the, the evidence again. Let's be really careful about using prevailing wage in terms of art here, because that's not, it sounds like a market wage, but it's actually a wage floor that's set by Congress in law. So let me just give you some actual... Uh, that, that, he's saying saving wage. By prevailing wage, I mean... No, the American prevailing wage is a very... He means saving wage. He means saving wage. Okay, so you're not using it that way. I mean the market wage. Okay, so the, but that's, you got to be really careful, because lots of lobbyists... Uh, 
to, to conflict it. Right, I understand. On it at all, it's okay. Okay. I, I, I do want to add one thing, because I do work on this pretty closely. Um, let me just give you, you know, what goes on in the real world, which is Cognizant, over the last three years, brought in 18,000 new H-1Bs. Hired virtually no Americans during that time. 18,000 H-1Bs. Okay. Think about the scale of that. Facebook has 6,000 workers worldwide right now. So you're talking about three times that, cognizant of one company alone. And why do they bring in workers, that many H-1B workers? No one really can argue it's because there's a shortage of American workers. It's because they have a preference for H-1B workers. Now, what's the median wage that they pay those workers? $61,197. Okay? And I can go through it. 10th percentile, 25th percentile, etc. Anybody you talk to in the IT services business knows that these offshoring, what these offshoring firms do. You talk to executives there, and what they'll say, Neeraj Gupta, who was an executive at Putney, testified before Congress that the wages are about 20 to 25 percent cost savings. And, that's, and they're replacing Americans in a lot of cases. They're, tra they're forcing the American workers to train in formal replacements. It's happening right now in Rochester, Xerox is outsourcing the HCL product engineering. And this is not just IT services. This is designing the copiers and everything else. Why? Because it's cost saving and American engineers are actually training in places. I'm, I'm going to try and pull us a bit out of the, the weeds because I, this is a, a debate that's been going on for a, a very long time and people know a lot about it, but not everybody in this room is part of that debate or is interested. I wanted to, to try and just pull back a little bit and think we know that the, the nature of these jobs is changing. I mean, even if you talk about what jobs were 10 years ago or 15 years ago in IT, they're very different from the types of jobs people are doing now, and that they're going to continue to change. Um, I wonder if we look ahead, if you could talk a little bit more generally about where you think we don't have to worry and where you think we might have to worry. And I think this is to try and say, well, are we worried about bachelor degree or community college degrees in in IT or petroleum engineering, or are we worried about PhDs in biology? Um, basically, are, are the places where you think the, the labor market is working fine, and people are responding to the right signals, and we're getting the people that we need, and are there places where you think this isn't happening, that for whatever reason, um, for instance, um, I'm doing a study of the postdoctoral system. We know that um, only about a quarter to a third of the postdocs are moving into tenure track faculty research jobs, which is why they're doing postdocs in the first place. Is you know, and that's worse in, in the life sciences, not so bad in chemistry perhaps. But I think I would like to just have you think a little bit about that, not to focus on IT perhaps, and not to focus just on entry level jobs in IT, but to step back and say there are areas where I think there might be a shortage and um, or I think we should worry or there are areas that are getting a lot of attention that we don't have to worry about. And we could start with Jonathan. Okay, yeah, so I think the academic labor market is very different than the, the private labor market, uh, especially for PhDs in fields like biology, chemistry, and other sciences. And uh, I think one of the reasons for that is that universities can draw on students from all around the world, and there are no restrictions whatsoever on, on, on bringing them, them in. And, and so it's, it's there's a heat, the supply is much larger than it is for every other sort of worker. And the fact is that universities don't create new products with, with, that bring in new revenue in, in the same way that the companies do. They have fixed budgets that depend on what alumni donations are and what NSF grants are, things like that, that don't respond as rapidly uh, uh, or adjust for, to market forces in the same way that they do. I would like to just comment, though, on, on Hal's point that uh, it's actually you know, not that difficult to get a, you know, a science degree, uh, and, or, or, you know, and there's not really a problem with dropping out. There's, there's actually a number of very good studies that have looked in a detailed way, much more detailed than the sort of survey evidence that Hal's <coughs> studying. So Peter uh, Arcia Dacono is an economist, has an MBER working paper looking at all UC all students in the UC system. Uh, Ralph Steinbricker uh, has published recently in the Review of Economic Studies using uh, data from uh, an, an elite liberal arts school. 
and uh, Eric Bettinger has used data from the Ohio Board of Regents of all of Ohio public universities. What they find is that about 50% of, of people intending to major in the STEM field uh, do not graduate in STEM field. And just to give you Arcia Diacono's evidence, that the percentage switching to a STEM major is only 4%. The percentage switching out is 57%. So that's not at all parity. And, if you, and he looked in detail at the sorts of students that, that switch out. Inevitably, it's the students that have lower SAT or ACT scores that, that switch out at much higher rates, which is because these are hard fields. It's not, it's not easy to get a bachelor's degree in, in these fields. One has to have a very strong K through 12 uh, preparation. And the fact is that our schools are not preparing huge swaths of, of students, students do so. And it's especially true for uh, blacks, Latinos, uh, who are trapped in some of the worst performing schools in the country. And to sort of wash over that fact and act like it's not a problem is to me very disturbing. And, and, and in terms of discouraging STEM work, my concern is that the sorts of analysis that Hal's doing saying that the wages aren't that great, there's, not a, there's, no, there's an abundance of workers, that, to me that discourages people, from, especially people in those groups, from uh, pursuing STEM majors. So those are some of my concerns. Uh, from, from Hal or Ron, um, this also leads into the question of quality. I mean, one of the debates you hear is that, well, we're, yes, we can get people that might say they have the right degrees or seem to have the right training, but they really aren't the people we need for the, you know, who are the really going to be productive or really going to do what needs doing. Um, so but in both looking at both quantity and quality, um, how do you view that issue? And how do you respond to John's point? Let me pick up a piece of that, but also to your first question, that where I think the STEM shortage uh, issue derails us is, probably your quality question, is producing the right kind of people, or focusing on the right, on the right uh, skills and things that we did. Because in this and STEM shortage hysteria, you know, it's, it's more of narrowly defined math, science, you know, more calculus, for example, being pushed. Well, it pushes other things out. And when we talk to employers, what we find the real need is rarely a more technically qualified worker. And yet, you know, very rarely do I talk to an engineering manager who says we can't find candidates who have good technical skills. What we're looking for is the broad base skills, you know, communication, the ability to work across borders, whether it's uh, disciplinary borders, cultural borders, organizational borders. So what they want are these broad-based skills, and that's really where education should be focused. But when you get this very narrowly defined STEM shortage of you know, more math, more science, and look what the schools respond to, it's pushing out other subjects, other approaches, a more broad-based approach. So that, I think, is one of the, uh, you know, where we get off the rails in the STEM shortage beyond just do we have enough. It also seems to drive content in the wrong way. And you know, the educators who know what they're doing, they look at NSF as pushing the other direction, about more broad-based education, about interdisciplinary education, about trying to broaden that. And that means uh, looking at it, you know, I think, in a different way. Uh, the other point? Oh. Oh, is it? And also, just if, you know, where, you know, where is there a problem? I mean, you're saying, well, we have an oversupply. Is that, where is that not true? But it's, again, it's, it's you know engineers who can work across, have good communication skills, who can write and do all those things. That's what the employers say. I, I think we're in this this zone of it's you know it's black or white, right? So Rob kind of alluded to something called lumps of labor. That if you add one more worker, it's going to take a job out of if you graduate one, one more engineer. Of course, that's silly, right? And in fact, I've promoted engineering as a profession, including at EU. I think we need to look at balance, so that's the question, really, is balance. To answer your question, I don't think we know whether we need more specialists or more generalists because we're not collecting data on the, at that level uh, to know what's offshoreable, what's not. There's been some uh, speculative research by Rob, by uh, Lori Kletzer, by uh, Alan Blinder to see, to see what's, what are the jobs of the future, which, things are gonna be ge which jobs are going to be geographically sticky, which ones will be leaky. I can say that at the sort of more micro level, you can look at power engineering. It's not the best paid uh, in terms of electrical engineering, but we know there's a demographic shift coming. And what you see is some response from the education community 
uh, to fill those jobs. So there's certain jobs that we can predict. The BLS employment pro projections I don't think are very useful uh, in fields where there's a lot of technological change. And let me give you an example. Um, in computing, BLS underestimated the growth of computing during the 1990s. It could never predict the hit of the Internet. And during the 2000s, it's over-predicted, over-estimated the growth in those types of fields. So I think we've got to be really careful. And just to give the hard numbers, BLS predicted that we would grow from 3 million IT occupations to 5 million between 2000 and 2010. When we got to 2010, we had 3.5 million. But we grew, but we didn't grow anywhere close to what those projections are. So I think we need to be careful. I think you need that richer and thicker description. Uh, and you need to engage those professional societies that really have a domain knowledge of what's going on within their, their um, area. Okay, um, Rob, and then we're going to open it yeah, up just to real questions. So uh, uh, this is an unusual part of the debate where I have to say I agree with Ron and Al. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, I don't think we know. I just know. wanted one point, that's all. <laughs> and I kind of think, I, I sort of with Hal, I think interdisciplinarity and, and multi, more, more multi-skills for engineers inside it is a good thing, but there's a lot of evidence about that, but that's sort of what I hear as well. I do want to make one point about why I think the shortage debate is critical. Ron and Hal don't like the shortage, you know, the saying there's a shortage because they, they believe it opens up the door for more H-1B visas or it doesn't close the door on H-1B visa issues and some problems. I think it's, I, I look at it from the opposite side. If we assume that there's no shortage, then why would we want to try to go back to the same level of NSF PhD fellowships that we had in the 60s and 70s? Why do we want to restore that? We don't have a shortage. Why produce more? Why really focus hard on getting colleges to do a better job of getting of, of, of lowering switch out rates. And some colleges do a really good job of lowering switch out, most of them don't. Why do we care about that? <coughs> Why would we care about middle school and high school reform and pushing it? Like, if there's no shortage. Now, having said that, the data all speak to me and say shortage, but I do think that there's two sides of that coin. If you don't say there's a shortage, then you take away the momentum for reform on, I think, all the things that you and I all of us would agree do you, on. Do you think it wouldn't be driven by quality? I mean, couldn't you drive it by quality rather than shortage? I mean, the point we agree is, what about a quality issue? What about the inequity issue that you know Jonathan talked about? Wouldn't that, you know, focusing on the right problem would drive the right solutions? No, because I don't. No, because I think there are three problems. There's the, the equity problem Jonathan has around around women and minorities. We don't do we want to do that if we had a shortage or not? Just out of, out of sort of fairness and opportunity. There's the quality problem, which is a real problem, but there is also a quantity problem. If, you, if you're doing a quality problem, if it's all quality, then you don't expand the NSF PhD fellowship program back to its 1970 levels. You go, oh, we'll just shrink it in half, keep it shrunk in half, because that's a, that's a quantity measure. So I think there are quantities. The same thing with you wouldn't really push for a lot more CS education in high schools, where a very, very small number of states have CS. As a, as a I, I think I would, I would disagree because I think in the rush to fill the numbers and focus on guest workers, it takes the pressure off of trying to develop quality programs here. But what I see is that employers with preferences to you know, hiring from offshore, um, then there's you know, less investment, there's less interest in supporting local schools, less interest in addressing all these problems. I think one of the sad things is that just as women and minorities are making real headway into the in IT in some of these fields, the hiring preferences are going to offshore, which are, are, are largely male, but away from the domestic populations that may need more support. So if you know an employer, you're going to support kind of a harder to train, harder to educate populations for you know all the obvious reasons of, of income and, and other opportunity, or just shift to a you know easier, ready-made, available, large source of offshore. So I think with the same objective, the way to drive it is not by the shortage argument, but really focusing on what are the exact problems and how do we address those problems, not walk around the problems and hope that, you know, somehow these other boats will be risen along the way. Well, look, I, 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 I just want to add one thing. You're going to get lots of chance. You, you can just answer somebody's question with whatever you were going to say anyway. I do want to bring people in. So yeah, it's it's be warned, you get the first question, but Ron might answer his own question instead. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good. Uh, 
Uh, just one quick question. Robert Shredda, President of International Investor. We don't have a dog in this fight, but I can tell you we, as Rob Atkinson knows, we've been looking into this lately and, and trying to examine the issue <coughs> as fairly as we can. Uh, one, one thing I've noticed talking to a lot of IT CEOs, uh, they've been disappointed. We, we talked a little bit about the quality of the American education system. But many of these CEOs tell us that they've been disappointed in the quality of the education of the foreign workers, guest workers that are coming over, that they're narrowly focused to, to perhaps receive cert certifications in highly technical areas, but beyond that, uh, they're failing. Conversely, though, they tell us that they're compelled, they feel, to add to their ranks because once a certain group uh, is, is in command of a certain IT sector within the company, um, there's language and other barriers that really disables many of the American workforce from joining. So I wonder if any of you could comment on that aspect. Okay. Right. <laughs> I think you I'll, 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 try to, I'll try to answer both, actually. Um, so yeah, I mean, certainly there, there's uh, this sort of overreach uh, where people have chased sort of cheap off offshore labor. And just to give you a sense of the labor differentials, wage differentials, you, know, you can hire a fresher, that means an entry-level IT worker in India, uh, for $7,000 and fully loaded, it's ten or 12000 if you can bring them in on an L-1 visa, you can pay them home country wages, or if you do something illegal like what Infosys was doing and bringing them in on a B-1, you can pay them again 7000 plus put them up six in an apartment. If you bring them on an H-1B, you pay them 60000 instead of 80000 So while those IT CEOs are complaining, the reality is they keep making those irre uh, apparently irrational choices. Uh, if you look at the growth of a, a cognizant while it's grown its uh, U.S. workforce by 18,000, and that means all foreign workers in the U.S., it's grown its, its uh, offshore workforce by about 75,000. Uh, these are very, very profitable companies. Um, so I've been waiting for the shoe to drop where delivering quality goes down, but it seems like the customers, whether they're Goldman Sachs or Bank of America, keep doubling down. I do think that there is this issue of, of cultural and and, and creating sort of islands and whatnot, but I don't think uh, anybody has really a, a addressed that. Um, I forgot what I was going to answer before, which is, what, oh, I, oh that, I got it back. I think it's naive not, not to look at the politics of all of this. The shortage argument has been around and has been used principally to argue for more guest workers and to, to say that, no, you know, this, this, they're, they're not connected, and that uh, Michael Bloomberg, who's a multi-billionaire, is pushing H-1Bs and immigration, um, Microsoft, Compete America. The IT sector has been pushing this for more than two and a half decades and arguing, look, in the, we, in the short run, we need these H-1Bs, uh, but in the long run, we need to train our own. We've had the same issue over and over again. At some point, you have to say, well, <coughs> maybe they're just not telling us really what they're trying to do. And to think that, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, you know, funds forward.us at $50 million um, and that there's no politics involved and that they fund Gordon Hansen and Matt Slaughter to do a report, I mean, you really have to, to, to look at what, how Washington works. It's all in. It's not just lobbying dollars. It's not just campaign contributions. <coughs> it's a whole uh, communications PR strategy. And they use these hooks along the way. So I would disagree with Rob. Uh, you know, you, want, you don't want to do the right things for the wrong reasons. I think you want to do the right things, and I think increasing STEM production, degree production, is a good idea. And I think there's trade-offs there, and it well, should be done for the right reasons. Well, well, look, the idea is, you want to get in a lot of questions. The idea, the, the idea that that's what their major thing is, that is just, that is just wrong. If you look at the high-skill immigration debate, the whole idea of staple the green car, really seriously expand the you know, green card immigration is heavily, heavily pushed by the tech industry. Why would they do that? It's completely against their economic interests, Rob. And you're and just, you're model the, other, the other thing that, that that bill does is expands funding for domestic training for STEM programs through NSF grants, through fees that charge h one visas that would then go to training programs. So the, the goals aren't contradictory necessarily at all. Okay, okay well, hold on. Next, next question here and then back there. Hi, my name is Contessa Bourbon from the New York Times. I'd like to ask the panelists, what kinds of incentives do you propose 
to encourage more students like early learning experience to to go into STEM education. What particular proposals do you have? Well, as it's great. We, we, as I said, Marilyn Mayo and I, we wrote a report called Refueling the U.S. Innovation Economy, which laid out some of those proposals. But I guess the, the two that I really like a lot, um, one is some sort of a prize or incentive program for universities that reduce switch out. I think universities know how to do this. They just choose not to. I was talking to Ed Lazowski, the head of computer science at the University of Washington. I asked Ed, how many more computer science graduates could you could you graduate from Washington State if you had a, you know, unlimited budget? He said we could double it. The reason we can't double it is because the university funding program, they won't expand CS because it means cutting English or whatever else. So I think putting an incentive on universities to reduce switch out would be a <coughs> strong thing. And the second thing is, is to really expand specialty math and science high schools. We have 100 specialty math and science high schools in the country, like, like Thomas Jefferson in this region. Or, if anybody saw the Intel <coughs> Science winner, was a, I think it was Montgomery Blair just won the Intel Science thing on cancer research, senior in high school. So we only have 100 of these, and I think we should have four or 500 of them. I think that would really, really help with the pipeline. Uh, all of the, okay, sorry, uh, real quick. I mean, all of the pro engineering professional societies are quite active here, so you can look at Tri-Engineer, uh, Tri-Engineering, uh, the NAE, of course, has been pushing Engineering Girl. There's a lot of women in engineering first robotics. So I think there's a lot of great activity trying to target particular uh, middle school kids, uh, and in particular middle school uh, girls. And so I, I think there's a, a, a lot of great activity of trying to address some of these inequities and to increase the, the potential of capacity in terms of pipeline. Jonathan? Yeah, there, there's some great non nonprofits like Girls Who Code, Black Girls Who Code, Mesa, that, that really try to work at the K through 12 level to gain students exposure, send them to math or coding camps, things like that. I think that's extremely helpful. <coughs> Another model at the high school level, which I think is, is, is really worthwhile and should be expanded all around the country, is what Virginia Beach is doing. I got a chance to tour their facilities. They have a state-of-the-art community college that's integrated with their uh, high schools. And what they do is they allow high school students from, from any school in the district to take courses at that community college that lead to certifications, at a very high paying, high in demand certifications in, in, in programming, in Cisco uh, related technology, in, uh, uh, in, in CAD software, and very, very sophisticated uh, skills that, that allow them to either deepen that skill if they, if they decide to pursue a four year degree or immediately enter the workforce and, and get a, an, a very competitive wage. And then I totally agree with what Rob said, that universities and even community colleges, I think, do actually know what they need to do. They need to provide students funding. They need to provide, especially to uh, the most vulnerable and at-risk students, uh, tutoring resources and uh, a, a schedule that is conducive to working. Uh, in many cases, so CUNY has a really exciting new program called ASAP that has had fantastic results in, in, in increasing attainment across all disciplines, not just STEM. And it involved, it was expensive in a way, but the, the payoff to taxpayers was enormous. Thank you. Yeah. Can I sure. yeah. uh, thanks very much. I'm George Dragnich. I'm a former assistant director general of the International Labor Organization in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, I'm concerned from the ILO perspective that you've glossed over K through 12. Uh, that, that a modern economy, and ours certainly fits that, has to depend upon high school graduates to take jobs that have nothing to do with what you've been talking about. Uh, some years back, I spent a sabbatical year working with a business organization working on educational reform, and the chairman of our board was the CEO of UPS, United Parcel Service. And, the reason for that was that UPS had to interview three to four workers for every entry-level driver position. This had nothing to do with driving a truck. It was operating a handheld computer that they carry up to the, your door with your parcel. And the reason is that that handheld computer requires eighth grade math, and our high school students didn't have it. And my industry contacts tell me years later, nothing's changed. The educational system in America is still failing industry, they're not giving them work-ready graduates, and our people are, are needlessly uh, under or un unemployed. I'd, I'd appreciate it if you might address that. Thank you. 
Next, I was going to direct this to, to Rob, because he wrote a piece for issues in which he made the distinction between providing some STEM for all and all STEM for some, which is whether or not our problem is that everybody needs a certain level of, of math training and ability, or whether we really need to be nurturing those people that have a, both the, the talent and the interest to pursue it more ex extensively. So I wonder, how would you respond to that and the sort of minimum level of skills everybody needs and the skills that we really need for an innovative economy? Yeah, I mean, one of the areas I think, again, Hal and I would agree on is that there's a, if we're not talking about a large cohort here, we're maybe 10 percent if you really have the largest definition, probably more like 5 percent. So there's a small segment of people who we have to have as a society who are very, very good at this stuff, and they need to get even better. Uh, and then there's the rest of us. Uh, and the rest of us need all sorts of skills, like eighth grade math. I don't think I ever use anything more in my life, even in the think tank, than eighth grade math, but you never know. Uh, you know, the ability to write, the ability to communicate, the ability to think analytically, to think creatively, those are sort of, sort of generalized uh, 21st century skills. And I, I didn't talk about it because that's not really what this debate was about, but I agree with you that that's what we should be thinking about. And I actually think one of the problems with the education system is it's focused on teaching people things uh, you've learned in European history as opposed to teaching people generic skills where you can learn something through the learning European history. And, and I think we got to start to change that and then stop worrying about what people learn, particularly sort of the, all of the rest of us. I don't care whether people learn history or whether they maybe take pre-law or, or logic or philosophy. What difference does it make? You, know, you want them to have these kind of basic generic skills around thinking, analytics, and math. Susan. Hi, so I'm Susan Singer. I direct the Division of Undergraduate Education at NSF. And it's fascinating, right? There's two separate threads of discussion constantly going through this. We keep coming back to the quality issue, and there's also the shortage issue. And one of the things I'd be very curious on your perspective is improving STEM education requires really persistent, sustained effort over time building the evidence base. And how do we link or should we not link the quality and the shortage issue, right? Because the shortage issue takes left turns all over the place. And how do we separate out that argument, which is a really interesting one, I love all the perspectives. How do we honor that without derailing the really, you know, kind of we need to keep moving forward in good and creative ways so that for whoever moves into these different STEM fields, they are really well prepared and ready to go. I think that was the answer, wasn't it, Susan? You, that, uh, we need to separate out the shortage argument while we're while we're doing all the things that you're doing to develop good quality education and keep that kind of steady keel, whatever the shortage or labor market issue is, just to improve. Yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, it's an honest question, right? I mean, are there separate issues, and yet the shortage issue is often used, right, as a policy lever or something? to drive improvement, which then could do the, the left turns, but it's also possible that there could be a much more robust, healthy discussion if the two were more fully integrated, and all of you are working in areas that focus on shortage, so I'm really curious how you think about the appropriateness of making the quality argument within the context of the work that four of you are engaged in. Okay, so I would I think the policy objective is better served by separating the two. Because I think it, what you're saying is because it becomes mixed in there, all of the uh, shortage arguments that have a lot of policy and political implications that are separate from the quality issues derail the quality discussion. What I hear from some of the education community is that, that because you can get more attention with the shortage argument, the kind of uh, hang, hang their fortunes on that, and I think that's a, a dangerous strategy because the, the shortage argument, you know, really should exist separately, and that you need to build the case for quality, whatever the uh, labor market demanded. So that. So I, I'd say just a couple of quick things. I mean, we keep forgetting about incumbent workers, right? Mm -hmm. There's folks out there, and so you have companies like Microsoft who complain that there's shortages simultaneously laying off 5,000 workers. So what's going on there? It seems to me that we're not doing enough workforce development for incumbent workers. We need to create resilient and durable careers, and that can't be done just at the bachelor's level, right? It can't be just done in undergraduate education. 
And what scares me is when I graduated from engineering school in the late 80s, it was a universal benefit to get tuition reimbursement to go back to school to take classes. That's no longer the case. And that's not because companies are bad. It's for, for rational reasons. They don't see the tenure and the connection between worker and employer being very long, so they're not going to recoup that kind of investment. So all we have is this Hope Scholarship, which is, uh, what, $1,000, which doesn't even buy a course at my university. So I think we need to be thinking much more about the career path and career de development. I know the professional associations serve some of that, but the reality is I'm very active with IEEE. Our members in the U.S. are declining <coughs> 1, 2 percent, and for young people it's very hard for IEEE to capture those young people. And that's scary given the nature of the labor markets now being much more uncertain and much riskier. Thanks. I, I was curious to get um, Robert or Jonathan respond to this idea of the continuing education and the existing workforce. We talked a lot about entry and whether or not we need to be educating more young people. Um, but what about this issue of aging, you know, higher paid, more experienced workers? Um, you know, is, is this a problem? And then if so, what thoughts do you have on that? I mean, I think I'm going to agree with Ron again here. Uh, I don't know enough about that particular part on the on engineering, but if you look at the overall U.S. economy, the data that we've seen shown or found, uh, U.S. companies today, companies in the U.S. invest about 38 percent less in workforce training than they did a decade ago, and for very rational reasons, as Ron says, uh, they're, they're looking at short-term gains. There's higher turnover of workers, so that's why one of the things we've proposed is, is expanding the research and development tax credit, <coughs> called the knowledge tax credit. So you get a tax credit for putting one of your engineers through Ron's course or training incumbent workers on the shop floor, just to try to give companies some financial incentive to do more of that. Um, so I would agree that we, we don't anywhere do enough of that. I, I agree with that also. I'd like to see more funding go into training of incumbent workers. Uh, and, and I think this is particularly important for, for STEM issues because, especially in IT, the, the, the skill requirements are changing so rapidly. If you look at which specific skills are the hardest to fill uh, using job openings data? It's, it's, it's skills like Ruby on Rails, Perl, things that were not widely used a few years ago. It's iOS, it's Android software, things that you know, weren't invented except for a few years ago. So it would have been impossible for an older uh, computer scientist to have, have already studied that. So why not give him or her the opportunity to go back, take a, you know, a couple months off, and get a credential where they've now mastered that, that new programming tool. Can I just throw in, there's a really good little book by Peter Capelli that covers some of these things in the broader economy of why companies are leaving vacancies open. They're looking for that perfect match in the IT sector. It's called the purple squirrel. You're chasing the purple squirrel. You never get the purple squirrel. Why? Because he doesn't exist, right? <laughs> Uh, my name is Ray McGee, and I work at SRI International. Um, thank you for uh, really stimulating the debate. I'm just wondering now, what next? Is there any point of consensus? Is there any approach wrong after you know, a lot of the heat has been generated uh, and interesting facts have been shared? I'm wondering how we can reconcile the two varying uh, perspectives on this whole issue, and what's the way forward? Every, every, my job? No. <laughs> if you're depending on me for the answer, you're in really big trouble. Um, why don't we start? We can start. We'll go in the opposite direction this time. We'll start with Hal. Um, well, I think we've had some areas of consensus here and agreement, which was a nice surprise. But, uh, you know, the, the common piece is, of course, the interest in, in strengthening the workforce, strengthening the economy. And so everybody agrees. I, think that quality education and targeting uh, where that's most needed, it was, you know, as Rob pointed out, the discussion about you know, the innovation dependence on the STEM workforce is a very, very small population that we depend on, and we should enlarge it, but that's really at the margins of the larger education issues, which have to do a much broader population. And you know, I, I think <coughs> among the things that uh, we're trying to point out is that trying to pin that on a shortage argument leads it off the rails. And so we'd like to see the, you know, where we have the point of consensus, the quality education, diffusion of STEM and a variety of programs and supporting populations that are 
really underserved should be the forefront. And that's not well, and here's maybe we disagree, that's not well served by this sort of smokescreen of a shortage argument. And, uh, you know, another point I think is there is that the large guest worker programs really do have a negative impact on the domestic workforce. Again, by domestic, I mean immigrant, native, citizen, permanent resident. And particularly those populations where opportunities could be opening up are now instead being filled by shifting to offshore. So that's that's the point where I think it comes together. Okay, Rob? So I think there are points of agreement, uh, although I have to say I don't think their uh, our goal is advanced by a smokescreen of a surplus argument either. Um, I think we could all agree, I'm, I'm speculating here, but we could certainly all agree on many of the domestic policy reforms we talked about. Uh, I think some of the cuts to higher education, some of the cuts to the NSF budgets, uh, more opportunity, the kind of program John was talking about, I probably we would agree on expanding uh, green cards for engineers and scientists. Uh, I think there's maybe some areas even on H-1B. Ron, you're more of an expert on the actual law, on it, but as I recall, one of the proposals was to give workers uh, so they're not indentured servants to give them the freedom to move. Uh, I think that's a good idea. Uh, so there are probably more overlaps than probably still some core differences, but there probably are some many overlaps. So let me be a little bit irascible about this, because um, again, we're sort of sidestepping all of the politics involved here, and until we confront and address that, I think we're going to miss the boat. I mean, there's there really are multiple stakeholders who have interests that are sometimes in conflict, sometimes in concert, and until and unless we have uh, policy institutions that recognize that and translate that into the politics and the policy making, I think we're going to have a lot of difficulties. And, and, and I think we can agree on, hopefully, the goals, which would be a healthy STEM labor market. But let me just go back to the rising above the gathering storm. You know, that, um, that was a, a fast-track uh, study. It had not a single person who was representing American workers' interests on that. And, and I, you know, I, I think that's a big failing of a, a major policy institution. Uh, and that, that particular document got turned into law, the America Competes Act, very quickly. So, you know, I really do see these conflicts, and, and, and I think that you need to have the policy institutions really step up and come up with good analytic frameworks where we can draw some consensuses about <coughs> looking and examining uh, these kinds of labor markets. Yeah. I've been pleasantly surprised to hear that Hal and Ron seem supportive of investing scarce public resources in STEM education programs and other things, given that they say that we're graduating too many STEM workers as it is. Uh, so it, it seems to me that their argument, you know, if you take it as it as it stands, discourages people from getting the political capital together to invest in in, in education programs that will bo ultimately boost STEM uh, attainment. And it seems to undermine the efforts of, of the many nonprofits and, e and even corporate philanthropic arms around the country that are working to address this problem. And, and that's why it's so important. That's, that's why I wanted to come here today, really, because uh, I think making the, the case, uh, laying the facts out, as, at least as I see them, uh, that do indicate that there is uh, in, in, in excess demand, there is supply for uh, not just STEM workers, but college-educated workers broadly, uh, is, is extremely important uh, in order to maintain uh, political momentum to solve the, the vast inequalities we have in, in the skills that uh, groups of people ha have in this country, and to make sure that everyone has a fair opportunity to succeed in whatever profession they choose. Okay, um, with that, I think we've exhausted our allotted time. So um, please join me in thanking our four panelists.